Marshal Dushuga. Welcome everyone to the MOPC Languages channel. On today's video we'll talk about the Dokchin Mot, the Chechen language. The Chechen language is spoken by roughly 1.4 million people, mostly in the region known as Chechnya, inside the Russian Federation. As you can see there in the map, Chechnya is a semi-autonomous republic within Russia, which neighboring Ingushetia and Dagestan, among others, and also bordering Georgia to the south. During the Soviet Union, Chechnya and Ingushetia formed a single Chechen English Soviet Republic which was then dismantled into two republics. The first mention of Chechnya in history was as Gilia during the Ottoman and Persian domination of the Caucasus during the Islamic times for the, much of the Middle Ages and the early modern era. In the early 1700s we had the first Russo-Persian War, the war between the Persians and the Russians, which was also the first contact between Russia and the Chechens. The name Chechen itself, which is different from Nuochi, which is how the Chechens call themselves, comes from a village name in Chechnya, where the Russians first met the Nuochi, the Chechens. In the early 1800s, we had the Second Russia-Persian War, where Russia finally incorporates the entire Caucasus region from Persia, and from then on, the Chechens become a part of Russia until today. The first written documents in Chechen were made in the Arabic Persian alphabet in the 1700s, 1800s, but the Chechens typically didn't write their language all that often. Especially after they were incorporated by the Russian Empire, the Chechen language was uh, suppressed to a large degree. After the Russian Revolution, between 1925 and 1936, the Chechen language was written with a version of the Latin alphabet that you can see there on the screen. But after the rougher period of Stalinism kicked in in the 30s, the Cyrillic alphabet was imposed on Chechen, and that's the alphabet that Chechens still use today. In the 1940s, the Chechens suffered one of the worst disasters in their history, where they were deported by the Soviet authorities, along with the English, which are a neighboring ethnicity that speaks a very similar language. They were deported to Central Asia and to Siberia, they were accused of Nazi collaboration, and many thousands died. There were awful cases of torture, desperate... <clears throat> Everything was done in desperate conditions. It was... the entire, the entire population was moved out of the territory and uh, taken to Central Asia. In 1956, the Chechens and the English are allowed to return to the Caucasus, and then they become a part of the Soviet Union until well, in 1991, the Soviet Union itself disappears, and the Chechens start their struggle to independence. So we have two Chechen wars, 1994 to 1996. was the first one. Uh, they didn't win, they didn't get independence. And the second war, when uh, our uh, buddy little Vladimir Putin emerges as the military leader of Russia, that finally subdues the Chechens, keeps Chechnya within Russia and then proceeds to become the leader of Russia until today, that, that was 20 years ago. Today, Chechnya has been substantially rebuilt. You can see there are pictures of Grozny, the capital of, of Chechnya, which in Chechnya is called Sujahal. On this map, we see the modern Nakhdagestanic or Northwest Caucasian languages. You can see the Chechen language there, English, which is very closely related, and the more distantly related language of and the more distantly related languages of Dagestan. You can see uh, the language diagram here. There's a Nakh branch that gives us the Bats language, which is spoken by only a few thousand people, very minor language, the, the English language and the Chechen language, which form the Vainakh group within Nakh. And the other branch is the Dagestanian branch. It's a very wide branch, it's a very large branch, I didn't put every language there on the diagram. Um, Avar is the second most widely spoken language in the family with about 700,000 speakers. English has about 300,000 speakers. There are many more other languages within each branch. When it comes to phonetics, Chechen is a pretty impressive language and it's going to be impressive not only there, you're going to see grammar is also pretty amazing. Chechen is one of my favorite languages. 
Phonetically, Chechen is one of the biggest languages in the world. It has around 50 consonants, depending on how you count, and roughly at least 20, 26 vowels, if you include, of course, diphthongs and nasal vowels and long versus short vowels. Of course, that, that's a inflated number because of those uh, se secondary features. But uh, Chechen has the vowel system similar to that of German or, or other Germanic languages. So it has not only, not only the normal A, A, E, O, U vowels, but also the Ö and Ü vowels. You can uh, appreciate here a sample of spoken Chechen taken from the Wikitongues project. The consonants of Chechen are similar to those of Arabic in many regards. So it has the k sound, the uvular stop, uh, which is deeper than the k sound. It's uh, uh, which is written this kx in the Cyrillic alphabet. Normal age sound as in English is written as an X with a palochka, which is that uh, typically Chechen letter that looks like a capital I. And the X with the Miakizdak, um, which looks like a short B, is the Ha sound, which also exists in Arabic. I put there the Arabic equivalent letter next to it for reference. Chechen has ejective consonants, so there is a Ka and there is Ah, there is a ah, and there is a. Ah. The palochka alone, the capital I, uh, has the sound of a, ah, similar to the hein of Arabic. So a word like apple is haj, aj, aj. You can see other letters below, tsa, tra, pra. That is the, uh, the, 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 the effect of the palochka after a letter is that it forms a, an adjective consonant. So you have word, a word like pelg finger. When the vowels, as I said, the, the vowels of Chechen are pretty much similar to the Germanic languages. It has um, to form the ablaut vowels. It uses the miakizdak, which is just that little b shaped letter, to form derived sounds. So the a plus miakizdak has a, much like the umlaut in German. So the o with the miakizdak forms the ö or ö. The U, which is a Y-shaped letter in the Cyrillic alphabet, uh, plus the Miakisdak forms the U. And the long U has a also a uh, that short I after it. It's only the only vowel, the only long vowel that is marked in Chechen spelling. The U, the long U, because it contains that uh, short I after it. Uh, otherwise, long vowels and short vowels are not distinguished in the standard spelling of Chechen. Grammatically speaking, Chechen is an SOV language. That means it's a subject-object-verb language. The verb comes typically at the end of a sentence. The noun phrase is D-A-N. Determiner, determiner being a demonstrative pronoun because Chechen has no articles. So it'll be words like this, that. The adjective comes afterwards and the noun comes last. So it's a head final noun phrase similar to that of English. It's, um, the adjective comes before the noun. It has, unlike English, it has postpositions or case marking suffixes to the nouns and to the modifiers as well. So typically, not prepositions, postpositions. The language displays ergativity, which is a feature whereby the verb tends to agree with its object and not with its subject whenever there is an object of a verb. That's, uh, we're going to see details about that later. And uh, most striking of all, Chechen has six genders. We know from European languages that uh, languages can have two, three genders, masculine, feminine, and neutral. 
and then each each uh, noun has an inherent gender which doesn't necessarily match its uh, real meaning well in Chechen there's a masculine a feminine and four non-human neutral inanimate genders uh, which makes agreement pretty complicated as you will see here we see the pronoun system in Chechen we I'm not showing every case here only the four main cases there are there are a total of 10 cases in Chechen in addition to sub cases within the locative case but we're gonna see that later so the pronouns uh, the two main cases are the absolutive and ergative because Chechen is a is an ergative language the main case the the, 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 the subject the unchanged the basic case is called absolutive and not nominative even though some, some, some grammars call it denominative the absolutive case in the first column in the first bright yellow column shows uh, the form of the pronouns that is used as a subject of intransitive verbs as well as uh, linking verbs the ergative case is used as a subject of transitive verbs that is verbs that have an object the genitive case and the dative cases are um, pretty much as in all European languages they have uh, the function of a possessive in the genitive and the dative is the receiver of an action we can also see that in Chechen there's a distinction between first person plural exclusive and first person plural inclusive that is a distinction that is not common uh, in Europe or Western Asia mostly in Native American languages not only North American South American languages have that distinction uh, the first person exclusive means that you're talking about only yourself and your group where, where, where and excluding the person you're speaking to whereas the first person inclusive includes the person you're talking to so you're talking if you're saying oh well let's get out of here if you're saying well we're going to go out of here uh, if you use the exclusive uh, pronoun it means only we here and not you who are listening are gonna get out of here there is no gender distinction in the third person pronoun so the isa in the singular and ush in the plural which changed to so and sara in the ergative they mean both he and she as well as it they can, can refer to anything and now the gender prefixes of chechen not only does chechen have six genders but the agreement particles are not in the end of the word as it happens in European languages such as German, Spanish, French, Russian. The gender element is in the beginning of the word. That reminds us of the African languages such as Swahili and Zulu. They have a prefix based gender system as well. So these prefixes, they are taken by adjectives and verbs. The nouns themselves don't, they don't necessarily have any prefixes. The nouns just can start with any, any consonants. Uh, most uh, pref uh, gender prefixes and nouns have eroded over time they have disappeared but in adjectives and verbs there's a minority of uh, of, of them that takes the, those prefixes so only about 30 percent of adjectives and 30 percent of verbs have gender prefixes the other the 70 percent remaining simply have absolutely no prefix and therefore have no no gender agreement so let's see what that means let's take the verb hila which is a verb to be in the present form it's irregular it's u and in the past it's ar but uh, it takes the, uh, the this verb requires a prefix in the present and the past so you can, it can't be used alone so when I, if i say i am i have to say so vu if i'm a man but if i'm a woman i'd say so you because the v prefix is masculine but the y prefix is feminine so even though the pronoun is the same a woman would say it differently from a man in the past sovara or soyara masculine and feminine but if you use a word like aj which is an apple the apple is a noun in the sixth gender the one that takes b in the singular and d in the plural so an apple is is aj bu but apples are is ejash du 
There is an exception with the first person plural and second person plural pronouns. They don't take the B prefix, which is the plural of masculine and feminine. They take the D prefix. So in that case, you have to say to do. We are inclusive. Vai do. We are exclusive. Or shu do. You people are something. But if you say uh, the boys are kenti bu. Or they are ush bu. He is my brother. You say is san vasha vu. He, my brother, is, but she is my sister, is a son, Isha, you. So Vasha is brother, Isha is sister. To form the plural, typically Chechen uses either the consonant sh or the consonant y. So kor is a window, koresh is windows. Ma maha is a needle, mehi is needles. You see that there is also a vowel change in the middle of the word. That's the ablaut, similar to German. It's a very common process, actually far more complex in Chechen than it is in German. U is a board. The plural of board is unash. But is a month or the moon. The plural is betanash. Dog is a heart. The plural is degnash. Zud is a woman. Zudari is women. Mot, language, metonash, languages. There are more irregular plurals on that. So there's a cha, which is a bear, the animal. The plural is cherchi. Gala, which is duro, makes galnash. Kuzga, which is a glass pane or mirror, has kuzganash. Tur, which is a sword, has a plural tarrash. A lot of plurals are irregular in Chechen. Vowel changes, ablauts in the stem vowel are extremely common. Not only, not only that, but also because you can see the addition of new consonants in the end of the word. These consonants, they probably were present in ancient Chechen, in the ancient plural language that the Chechens and the English and the Bats spoke, and maybe all the Dagestanians and Nakh peoples. But in Chechen, in the absolutive form, the basic case, they withered away because they were finite, they, they were left dangling at the end of the word. So some phonological process actually made certain uh, final consonants impossible in Chechen. So in the basic case, they just uh, fell, fell off the word and they are retained in the other plural forms as well as the case forms, genitive, dative, and so on. These, these consonants, they, these ancient consonants, they tend to, to return to life, much like what happens in Latin and Greek. Uh, here we can see the Chechen declension chart. I took a very regular noun, gour. Gour is a horse with an adjective leder, which is weak. So a weak horse is leder gour. In the absolutive case, we have leder gour. In the plural, leder gourish. You can notice that the adjective does not go to the plural. The adjective only changes in the non-absolutive cases, this, the, the, the oblique cases where the, the adjective gains chu in the end, be it in the singular or in the plural. So the adjective declension is very regular. That is pretty much the rule for every adjective in Chechen. In the noun, things are a little bit more complicated. The, the noun, noun cases, the, the endings tend to be roughly those you can, you can see there on the chart, but uh, there are variations, there are changes, there are irregularities from noun to noun. You can see also that in the plural, the sh that marks the plural uh, disappears in a few cases. You have leder gorash, leder gorasha in the ergative, but in the genitive plural we have leder to govrin. And in the elative case, which is the case to go to a place, to go to a certain uh, location, leder to gorich. So, yeah, there are many strange phenomena there, and there are more cases than that. I'm showing you only the main cases, there are still another three cases that I haven't shown there. So let's take a look at a noun phrase in Chechen. Har is the demonstrative this, dikon is big, and bepik is bread. The noun phrase is exactly like English in terms of word order. Har, dikon, bepik, this big bread. In the oblique case, you have the word bread going to the genitive, bepkan, and the modifiers 
they go to the oblique case as well. In the case of Hara, there's an irregular oblique form. Instead of Harachu, we have Hoku. Hoku Dikachu Bepkan. Of this big bread. That's the genitive form. But this Hoku form is for all oblique cases. Ergative, genitive, dative, instrumental, anything. So Kalach Vu. I am in the city. Kala is city. This final age, the word is the locative case, in the city. Galach. So galach, so galach vu. I am in the city, said by a man. As bepik dina, I made bread. Uh, in this example, you can see the difference between the subject in the absolutive form, so, and the subject in the ergative form, as. So the pronoun I is so in the absolutive basic form, but the ergative form is as. And uh, the verb ina there, the verb dina is agreeing with the bread, not with the I. It is not it does not have the V that you'd expect if you if you agree the male subject saying that I made bread. It agrees with the object. It agrees with the bepig, which because the word bepig requires the prefix D. If you say that the girl made the bread uh, once again, the prefix of the verb doesn't change. Yo bepig dina. You still you still have the prefix d agreeing with the bepig. In the plural, mehkari bepig dina. Once again, the verb doesn't agree with the subject. It continues to agree with the bread. But if you say that God made the girl, then in that case, the verb will have to agree with the girl. So it, instead of dina, you have yina. Dalach yo yina. If the God made the girls, it would be Dala Mehkari Bina, because any noun, feminine or masculine in the plural, requires a B prefix. The dative case in Chechen is used, strangely enough, to mark the subject of cognate. Uh, or <clears throat> the dative case in Chechen is used to mark the subject of cognitive verbs. That is, verbs that imply something that happens inside your mental systems like I to know to want to feel to think to desire so soon here soon as the dative of me so it's to me knows the verb itself in Chechen doesn't change for person okay there is no first person second person third person form there's only a present a past we're gonna see that later there is no personal very personal conjugation soon Lea I want which is to me once Aston ago. Uh, to Aston, it sees. That is, uh, Aston sees. The verbal conjugation itself, as I said in Chechen, there is no person conjugation, no, no variation between I, I do, you do, he does. There's no first, second, third person or plural variation. So you only have a, an infinitive and a bunch of present, future, and present and past tenses. So malon, which is to drink. Notice that the final A, this final A letter of the infinitive form is automatically nasal in, in Chechen. So mala is spelled mala in Chechen, but it's pronounced malan. Malan in the infinitive becomes in the present tense molu. Tosa to feel becomes tusu. Dija to sleep becomes duju. Dieshan to read becomes dershu. So if you say I drink water, as, he, molo. As is the ergative form of I. He is water. And molo is the present tense of the verb to drink. He reads the newspaper. Newspaper is gazette, taken from Russian gazeta. So, gazette dershu. The verb agrees with gazette. Gazette is a D noun. So, the verb has to take the D prefix if it's a prefix verb. So, kniga yershu. Kniga, however, unlike azet, is not a D noun, it's a ye noun. So, it requires the ye prefix, the J. So, in that case, he reads the book, is so kniga yershu, not dershu. Uh, let's repeat that previous sentence there, so gazet dershu, and let's contrast it with the, the sentence below, which is the present, shows the present continuous, the present progressive. Is a gazet dershus who? If you add to the present tense a sh sound, instead of dershu, you make dershush. That's pretty much the progressive form of the verb, like the ing in English. It's like reading. Dershush is reading. 
And then you add after that the verb to be, which is vu, bu, you, du. Or you have the present progressive, to be reading. So he is reading the newspaper is Isa Gazet Dershushvu. But you also notice that the word he goes back to the absolutive form, the basic Isa form. Why is not why is it not in the ergative? That's because in the present continuous we have necessarily a double absolutive form. The subject and the object both stand in the absolutive. That's because the verbs agree the verbs there agree with the object and with the subject. You can see there that Dershus is agreeing with Gazette. It has a D prefix according to the object, Gazette. But the auxiliary verb has the V prefix, which is a masculine prefix agreeing with Isa. So that's a very strange thing because one verb agrees with the main verb agrees with the object, but the auxiliary verb agrees with the subject. So you have a double agreement there. Very, very strange. Isa Gazet Dershushvu. He is reading the newspaper. She is reading the newspaper in that case would be Isa Gazet Dershushyu. Because the verb to be in the end, the auxiliary verb has to agree with she. Is Shura Moloshvu. He is drinking milk. Tzitzig Shura Molosh Du. Tzitzig is a noun in the D category. It requires a D prefix for agreement. So the verb, the auxiliary verb in the end, vu, goes to the du form. Shura molosh du. Shura is milk, molosh is drinking, du is is. Tzitzik shura molosh du. Cat milk drinking is. In that case, molosh is a verb without a prefix agreement, so it doesn't change. Is a shura molosh vara. He was drinking milk. In that case, you put the auxiliary verb in the past, so you have the past progressive. He was drinking milk. The cat was drinking milk. The present perfect is formed with a, suff is formed with a suffix na. Malan, mela. In that case, the na was melted with the l, and you have a geminated double l, because milna becomes mela, and there was also a vowel shift in the middle. Diesha becomes diesna. Dieta, dietina, laha, lecha. Once again, in lecha we have a an absorption of the ne, of the n by the stem consonant ha. Instead of lechna, we have lecha. That happens a lot. There is a witnessed recent past in Chechen. Witnessed is because you've seen it. There's something called that, that, that is something called evidentiality. Evidentiality is a feature that is also very commonly present in the languages of Native America, South and North America. Uh, in Asia and Europe, that's pretty rare. Uh, evidentiality shows if you've witnessed the fact of your just uh, speaking of hearsay because somebody told you. So the witness pass is formed by e or u at the end. Mala, meli, desha, deshi, toha, tushi, and so on. The witness remote past is made with the same change as the recent uh, past, but with the ira in the end. No. Mala, melira, desha, deshira, and so on. That's the most commonly used form of past tense in Chechen, similar to the English uh, simple past. Roughly. There's an imperfect past as well for actions that has a, had a degree of progression in the past. So, malon, drink, molura, I drank every day, desha to read, dershura, I read the newspaper when I was a kid, most of the time. That's a continued form of the past, imperfect in its aspect. The future potential is formed with the present stem plus R in the end. So mala, we have the present of mala, we've seen it, it's molu. So the future potential is molur. Desha, deshur. Yetsa, which is to buy, has a present tense, yotsu. So it has a future potential, yotsur. So using this future potential, we can make the simple future, the most commonly form of future tense in Chechen, which is using the future potential, er form with the R in the end, plus the, the verb to be as an auxiliary. As bepig ötsur du, I will buy bread. If you just said as bepig ötsur, it means that I might buy bread, I should buy bread. It's a doubtful future. There's also a future progressive, which uses the same 
potential future form with the R in the end, then the HIR form, which is a derived from, from the verb to be, HILA, and then the verb to be conjugated in the past or the present in the end. As bepig ötur hir vu, I will be buying bread. That is usually used when you want to insert an action inside another action in the future. So when you arrive tomorrow, I will be doing something else. I will be in the middle of another action when another future action happens. Negation. We haven't spoken about negation. How do you say something is not? Bepig mer zadu is the bread is tasty. How do you say the bread is not tasty? Biepig mers that the verb to be in Chechen has an irregular negative form which is at. So do becomes that, is, is not. So dika vu, I am good. So dika vat, I am not good. A woman would say so dika you and so dika yat. In the past, so dika vara, so dika vatsara. I was good. I was not good. In the past tense, the negative form is atsara. But in most verbs, the negation is very simple. You just add tsa before the verb. So skole verdu. I go to school. So skole tsa verdu. I'm not going to school. I'm, I don't go to school. In Chechen, there is no proper relative clause. You can make a sentence like the man who buys cows. You have to say the cow buying man, yet ötzungstag. You have to use the relative form of the verb, which is un in the present and na in the past. So, yet ötzungstag is the cow buying man, that is the man who buys cows. In the past, it will be yet yetznastag, having bought a cow man, the man who bought a cow. So, that's a different strategy to make what we typically make using relative sentences. The derived modal verb forms are pretty much what the modal verbs make in English. Uh, so, for example, there is a malon to drink, malo to make somebody drink, a causative form, malita to let somebody drink, to allow somebody to drink, maldal, which is to be able to drink, he can drink, maldal, which is to start drinking, Many verbs have these forms, not all verbs have the right forms like that, but uh, it's a pretty extensive list. It's very complicated to form these these modal forms in Chechen. Chechen is also rich in light verbs. There is a noun plus a verb. That's a way to create new verbs based on nouns. So, because in Chechen you can, you can, you can create new verbs. You have to, if you say if you, you, you want to download something, you have to say that you want to do the download of something. So, yaz is writing, writing of, of, of words. Dan is a verb to do. So, yaz dan is to do writing, that is, to write. The verb to write in Chechen is yaz dan. But dan is a prefix verb, so it agrees with its object. So, as kechat yazdu, I write the letter. Kechat is a D noun, so the D there doesn't change. But kniga, as we've seen, is a Y noun, is a J noun. So, instead of as kniga yazdu, we have to say as kniga yazju, because you have to change the, the D prefix, even though it's in the middle of the word, you have to change it to agree with the object. If the verb is, however, intransitive, the, typically the, 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 the verb to do agrees with its own noun that is inside the verb. Bolch ban, to do work. In that case, the verb done already has the B prefix to agree with a bolch, which is work. So in that case, the B will always be there because the only thing it, it can agree with is the, the word work. There is no, it's not, it's, not a, it's, it's not a transitive verb, there is no object. So, so borg biesh vu, or so borg biesh vu, I am working. Now, the auxiliary verb still agrees with the subject. Certain verbs in Chechen change their meanings according to the case in which it, their subject is. For example, if the subject of the verb dieza is in a dative, dieza means to like. Soon, biepig dar dieza. I like making bread. But if the subject is in the ergative, then it means have to, must, should. As biepig dan dieza. I must, I should make bread. If you want to ask a question, a binary question in, in Chechen, you, you typically use the suffix e on the verb. 
You change the last vowel of the verb to E. Ischkole würde. He goes to school. Ischkole würde. Does he go to school? Who now works in what beats a hey? Do you know how to speak Russian? Hey, in the end, is the question form of the verb hea, which is to know. Hea is knows. Hey is does he know? Bitsa is the verb to speak. I hun du. What is this? I is this. Hun is what. Du is is. So you see that the question words are not put in the beginning of the, of the sentence. There is no frontalization of question words in Chechen. I dosh muh ala. This word, how say? So, how do I say this word? How does one say this word? I dosh muh alan. A couple of the pronoun, the interrogative pronouns like who and what have very different forms in the absolutive and ergative form. They are conjugated pretty much like nouns and they change substantially from the absolutive to the ergative shapes. Ho mila vu. You, who are. In that case, you use mila because it's a subject of a of the verb to be. So it's the absolutive basic form. But if you want to use it as a subject of a transitive verb, like to teach, who teaches the students? So that's, instead of Mila, use Ha. Ha hörch deshar hoshna. The word what changes from hun to stien. As hun dina. What did you do? Stien i dina. What did this? Because in the second sentence, the word what changes from hun to stien precisely because it's the subject of a transitive verb. What did this? Not what this did. In Chechen, there's also something called plurectionality. Plurectionality is uh, a feature whereby certain verbs change their shape or have even separate verbs. Uh, whether their uh, ruling argument, their, their head noun, is a singular or plural. So there are certain verbs like to sit in Chechen, that, that there's a verb to sit only if a person, one person is sitting, or if two or more, per, more people are sitting, or if two or more people are sitting. Um, that's uh, something that can be found in a number of Amazonian languages, but uh, once again in Europe and Asia that's uh, pretty much unseen outside of the Caucasus. Well, it's been a long video. I hope you've uh, survived it all and I hope you've enjoyed it or at least you've learned something from it. Don't forget to leave your comments below and uh, of course subscribe because this channel is going to have descriptions of every language on earth. Um, also leave your like if you want. So, um, well, see you next time.